This is 10 Questions to Cyber Resilience, brought to you by Assurance IT. Released twice per month, every episode brings you one step closer to cyber resilience by hearing how IT leaders are practicing cybersecurity. Resources mentioned in the episode can be found in the show notes. If you're ready to take your cyber resilience to the next level, be sure to subscribe so you can catch every episode. All right, so another episode we're going on here today, and I've got Christopher Riley from Exagrid who's joining me today. We're going to focus today on some topics related to on-premises storage versus the cloud, not necessarily storage all the time, but some strategies around keeping your data local, keeping your data in the cloud, the challenges, the benefits, and so on. Without further ado, I'm going to ask Christopher to introduce himself. So Chris, I want you to tell us who you are, who you yeah. work for, what you do, what's your specialty, and then we can get right into it. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Luigi. It's great to be here. Happy Friday to you. And we're very excited from Exagrid to be part of the podcast. I'm the Director of Solutions Engineering for the eastern half of the Americas. So that takes me from eastern Canada all the way down to Chile and Argentina. So a really big territory and it's interesting. It gets me to see a lot of different things that a lot of people are doing. A little bit different in every country. People go at this a little differently. So it's a very good exposure. For a long time prior to that, I did work in the channel. So certainly know a lot of the things that you're up against and can attack this from the perspective of a great channel company. So I think that should make this conversation interesting. Awesome. Yeah, we appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you're based in Boston. I'm based just north of Boston. Exagrid's headquarters are down here in Massachusetts and Marlboro, so not too far. And also just a quick five-hour drive to be in the great city of Montreal. (laughs) Hockey fan, Christopher? Hockey fan, yes. I was born and bred in Boston, so I've got to say I am a Bruins fan. Sorry nice. to all the Habs It's a good time to be there, a Bruins fan. It's a very, it's a very good, very time, good time. time. They're an exciting <laughs> young team, but always followed the Canadians and saw some really great games at the Forum over the years. Always fun. Nice. Very good. Very good. All right. Let's get started. Obviously, you guys sell great technology. And this is not necessarily about just the technology today, but it's more about some of the business challenges that a lot of companies face. So we're talking a lot about cloud-first models. Companies have, over the last decade, have looked at the cloud as the end all and save all of their business. And we're seeing a little bit of a retreat now. In my opinion, I think hybrid is going to be go-to model for a lot of businesses. But I want to get your opinion when it comes to local backup storage. So having your data locally residing in your four walls within your enterprise, even as more businesses move to a cloud first model, how important is it to still have that local backup storage for companies? Sure. As you've already referenced, cloud means so many different things to so many different people. And depending on the segment that you're in, the organization size, the applications that you're running, cloud first might be an appropriate strategy. It might not be an appropriate strategy. And I tend to agree that some type of hybrid scenario is really going to work for most people. But when you're talking about backups, there's a few things backups really need to be. They need to be secure. They need to be dependable. They need to be predictable. Those aren't all things that are really strong suits of many cloud providers. The backup piece of it is only part of the process. It's really having that ability to complete a restore in a timely manner. That's the bigger part of the battle when you're talking about data protection and backup and restoration. So having that data locally becomes very important because it's always being touched. Backup is something every day you've got your backup administrators that are checking for retention, they're checking for expiration, and it needs to be right there. Um, If an organization is using the wrong type of storage or thinking that backup data is too similar to an archive where it can just be kept in the cold for many years and at some point either ages off or they get rid of it. If you're in the cloud, every time you touch that data, you're going to pay for it. Cloud storage can certainly work if you're talking about archiving data, but if you're touching it, you're going to pay dearly for it. So backup data as an end result really needs to be treated differently and, in our opinion, is best served in the enterprise on-prem. Okay, so yeah. keeping that local copy is always, it's a recovery question, right? So It really is. It, it's about the continuity factor. How fast can you recover in case something really bad happens, right? That's right. Uh, and a lot of people forget that, that. And I often bring it up with clients. Is, yeah, great, you got a backup. 
that's fine. But have you tested it? How quickly can you get it back up and running? And that's really what the business cares about, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Backing up is a rubber stamp checkbox. That's what it is. No, being able to back up is a rubber stamp. You've got to have it. Just about anybody can do it. But how fast can you make the backup? Are you doing it inside the appropriate window? And more importantly, how fast can you recover it? Because downtime is money lost to most businesses. Okay. And so my next question, kind of you touched a little bit on it. And really, there are risks of relying solely on a cloud-based storage for your backup. And again, yep. th- th- this episode and this conversation is not to knock backup vendors or backup providers because sure, sure. insurance IT, we actually do obviously backup for our clients in our cloud. So we of understand course. the challenges, but we obviously promote having local data first and then yep. having a, a secondary or tertiary copy offsite. So what are the risks of relying cl- on cloud-based storage for backup in your opinion? Yeah, we've started to see a good amount of customers that have moved back away from the cloud. And the very first thing that they tell us is that the bills that they're receiving are just untenable. Not only we've been told that the bills are huge, but they're totally unpredictable, which is enough to drive any good chief financial officer, CFO, insane. They really need to know that there's going to be something that they can count on a monthly basis. So they're not ever being surprised. And that's rarely the case with some of these major cloud providers. The promise of available fast and cheap, it goes right out the window the first time a customer has to restore. And if that's a large volume, the egress charges start to come into play. So cost is a major factor, a major risk factor for them. Not only the going to experience those big egress charges, the performance of that restore, as we've mentioned already, is key. The longer that organization is down, the more they risk losing money. And we've seen a lot of businesses actually close because they couldn't get the operation back up and running in a reasonable amount of time. So that's a big, big piece of it is that recovery piece. If somebody's experiencing a disaster situation, that organization needs to get that infrastructure back up and running as fast as they can. And some of them are going to be willing to pay dearly when that performance is required to accomplish that. So businesses will lose money as long as they can't be up and running. And we feel that being on site and doing it with a product like Exagrid is a much more secure and faster, more reliable way to get your data back when needed. I'm going to ask you specifically about extra grid and the technology you obviously sell. Before I get to that, I have one other question I want to ask, sure. and I definitely want to learn more about what you guys are doing and how you're doing it. I know, frankly, because we use it here and obviously yeah, yeah. We, we use it with our customers, but it'll be good to get it from yourself firsthand on how it can potentially solve some business challenges. We are seeing a huge issue with IT labor shortage, technology. There's obviously a lack of skilled labor in the workforce right now when it comes yes. to IT. Agreed. Um, and obviously that impacts local backup or just backing up. What companies have done is basically say, I'm going to move to a cloud, make someone else do it for us, and we're done. But it, it obviously requires some kind of task skill set to maintain local backup storage systems. So what are the challenges you are seeing and can they be avoided or are we doomed because we just have a lack of IT staff in the industry right now? It's a great question. And the thing I would really point a lot of customers to is just because you decide to store your data in a different location. And let's face it, the cloud is just another data center that's not inside your four walls, as you've described it rightfully. But you still have an application that you need to take care of. You still have, maybe it's V, maybe it's Comvo, maybe it's Veritas or something different, but you're still having to manage that. And you still have to manage your data that's in the cloud. So that need for skilled labor doesn't go away. One thing as Exagrid was being built, and we've now been shipping product for well over 15 years, what was important to us was to build a world-class support organization. And whenever we engage with a customer, whether it's in a POC process or after a customer has actually made a purchase, they're assigned a tier two engineer. That engineer really ends up being like staff augmentation for that customer, because when they have an issue, they call directly into that tier two engineer. They're not jumping through hoops with triage or tier one. And the person that they call not only knows the application that they're running, they know their entire environment. So they're not asking a bunch of questions that are wasting time. In fact, many times when there's an issue, we're the ones calling the customer saying, hey, we've got to make some changes. We have to do this. So really having a high quality company that's going to provide you with the support necessary is really critical. Um, 
Another big part of it that comes to mind is the lack of scalability when you come to the cloud. Even in traditional backup solutions where they were backing up to disk or some type of a deduplication device, there's these constant needs for forklift upgrades because too frequently the processing and networking can't keep up with the amount of disk that they need. Not only does it become very costly, but every time you add a certain amount of disk, you're needing to add additional processing capabilities. Our Exagrid scale-out architecture eliminates that where every single appliance that we ship has networking, has processing, has memory, has disk. So everyone you add to a system of which you can add up to 32 systems and have about 2.7 petabytes in one system, it just continues to function as fast as it ever has. It scales out and it's not an inline deduplication device as many of them are. Then lastly, as I went back to complexity really is a factor. So if you're designing something that's very simple and elegant, it's just going to help maintain and not need large teams to support the efforts. Okay. So what I'm hearing is regardless of the vendor of choice or your technology of choice to back up, you need something that's simple, something that's scalable, something that gives you world-class support and is built for an enterprise. All critical factors. And here at Exagrid, and I'm very proud of this because I feel like when we when we sell something to a customer, we truly do enter a partnership with them. We don't dictate to a customer when something goes end of life. We don't dictate to a customer when they need to do an upgrade. We can work with them and make it on their terms. So it offers really good flexibility as well. Yeah, I think more and more vendors who are understanding the business challenges out there are less rigid, more understanding and more empathetic to the business challenges that companies face. And in my opinion, if you're empathetic and you understand and you have the flexibility, it allows for that true partnership and for longevity and especially support. I know a lot of customers who call us and who move back from a, a public cloud provider and they come to us and they say, well, I pick up the phone and try to get support and they don't get anyone. That's a major issue that customers sometimes forget when they're signing the first purchase order over to them. And then they quickly realize when they need the support, they're not getting it. So that hurts to an enterprise for sure. It really hurts both of our organizations as well. Coming from a background where I was in the channel, I'm sure Shirt IT knows that once you sell something to a customer, if they're not happy with it or if it's not functioning, as the manufacturer said, you're the ones getting that first call, which can be a very difficult scenario to be in. We have a tremendous net promoter score of 81, which is really a fantastic score to have. And customers are very happy with the solution and they remain customers for a very long time. Awesome. And I can attest that, again, the goal here is to talk about this, the industry in general, but I can attest that the extra solution is definitely something that we recommend. We obviously recommend to our clients. So I'm happy that we're having this conversation because it really is a challenge a lot of businesses are facing today, if not all. Next question that I have for you is really a little bit more technical, but really, and this is where I want to understand how you as an organization, the technology that you employ, it can help specifically in a ransomware attack. Because ransomware, let's face it, man, it's a matter of when, not if. Overuse that term, but it is the truth. And it could be a small ransomware attack. It could be a large one. Let's hope that if ever you do get attacked, it is a small one. What are the benefits of having this local backup storage in the event of a ransomware attack? And what specific strategies that you recommend that maybe you employ with Exagrid and to make sure that the data that you have, the most precious asset outside of your people, is stored and protected properly? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Certainly something that's on everybody's mind. We don't have a conversation with any customers where it's not a discussion. In general, speaking from an industry perspective, the thing you really want to do, the term for it is having an air gap, basically meaning somewhere between your network and the data, there's some gap that that a bad actor or a hacker can't get at. In many years, people created an air gap by making a tape copy and then storing that tape in some place that's secure. Maybe it's in a safe, maybe it's in the glove box of an administrator's car or in their home, who knows where. There's best practices around that. But certainly having that offline copy or air gap copy. Our architecture is based on that ability to create an offline or air gapped copy. The way they do that at Exagrid is we have a two-tiered system where when data comes into the device, 
it hits that top tier, which is our landing zone where data gets ingested and it starts our adaptive deduplication process. I won't go too deeply into that, but what it starts moving data to immediately is our retention tier. And that retention tier is for longer term storage, but that retention tier is non-network facing. So nobody from the outside or even inside can see that without the help of support or having the right access to it. So once data starts getting written there, ransomware can completely wipe out our landing zone where data is held for a very short time, knowing that those copies are being held in a retention tier that nobody has any way of getting to that. So having that air gap copy is the critical way and the way we achieve it is through a two-tier system. Okay. So just the yeah. fact that obviously an air gap, it's within the same physical device, but like you mentioned- For it- us, it is. It hasn't always had to be. We think it's a very elegant solution, the way that we do it all inside one box. So one appliance has two tiers of disk in that appliance. If you were delivered an appliance that was, for instance, called an EX84, it's going to have 84 terabytes of landing zone and 84 terabytes of retention tier. So it's actually a 168 terabyte box. So it's all in one. And the air gap is basically right in the middle of those, but that retention tier cannot be seen by anybody with network access. Okay, that's interesting. So the first, the landing zone, just to double click on that, the landing zone could potentially be corrupted or infected. It could. Uh, Yeah. It could, right. I don't want to say we don't care if it does, but that's not where we care about the data. If that's corrupted, if it's deleted, if it gets ransom, we say, you know what, go ahead, take it. That's fine. Because we know that we've got copies in the retention tier. And it's as simple as either enacting it on yourself, you put a freeze on the system, you make sure nothing else is happening on the system, and then our support can help you recover your data. Furthermore, we do two things to aid in that. One is a delayed delete process, which means if somebody is deleting files or volumes from the system, even though to their eyes and the administrator's eyes, it appears that volume has gone away and the space has been freed up. We hold that data out of the box. I believe it's a 10 day time frame. So if somebody says, geez, that wasn't supposed to be, it was an accident. It was a mistake. I fat fingered it. We have hackers. We know that data still exists because we keep a delay on the delete. We also monitor the system in any deletes and we set a threshold and that's something that we discuss with the customer and if they see a deletion that goes outside of that threshold outside of their normal operations we're again going to put a freeze on the system we're going to alert the customer we're going to make sure that was intentional and not malicious okay I know I've seen the technology in action and I have to say, I do appreciate it. And it is really world class. But like you described the strategy of having a place where it's secure, air gapped, which I think people are starting to learn more and more of the term- terminology. Again, the air gap could be local or it could be off site, network facing. Which is really, we want to basically have a three to one backup rule in any yes. backup. And what we do just as an extra is actually what we recommend to clients is that even though it's in that retention tier, and it's non network facing and air gapped. We obviously recommend customers to send it or replicate it to another device off site or even Absolutely. to our cloud, right? That well, gives you that extra layer. And that's very consistent with the 321 rule. Right. I should have said that prior to coming to Exegrid a couple of years back, I spent about six years at Veeam. So, you know, that 321 rule was something we discussed all the time, yeah. which for those that may not be familiar with it, it's keeping three copies of data on two different types of media and having one that's at least off site. So, 321. Exactly. So, that's yeah. a very solid strategy. And thank you for mentioning that. Well, we appreciate we're both Vima and X-Partners sure. here. So we understand the technology and the value of them working together. Appreciate you bringing that up. The next question I have, Christopher, is more conceptual. And I'll give you some of my thoughts here. And then I'd like to hear your opinion. In 2011, ironically, myself and my co-founder here at Assurance IT, we started a blog called One Cloud Road because we thought that the cloud was going to be the end all. And everyone was going to move their data centers into some centralized data center where it'd be metered and it would be make more sense for all businesses. And we've obviously come 11 years, 12 years later, I should yeah. say. And we've come to the realization though, some companies will never adopt cloud either. Don't have the capacity, their industry doesn't allow them to do that and so on. And a lot of companies have developed a cloud first model. But we are seeing some pullback. And you mentioned that earlier, I think cost is the 
biggest issue, but I have my reservations. I think there's a trust issue. Obviously cost is number one, but then there's like, where's my data? Who's managing this stuff? How yes. secure is it? So what are your thoughts with regards to the limits of cloud computing continuing to grow exponentially as we've seen? Have we hit a wall or are we going to still see the huge growth in cloud computing? And when I say cloud computing, mm -hmm. I'm talking specifically around infrastructure. SaaS yes. applications, PaaS is going to continue to grow, but I'm talking about you know, infrastructure itself. What are your thoughts about the limits in there? Yeah, I think a lot of it, of course, does come down to cost, as you've mentioned, but I think you look at cost and you have to define that around the size of the organization and what the mission of that organization is. So you may have a very busy architectural firm, traditional architectural firm that keeps a lot of data, but they don't have a lot of employees. They have one site. They may not be in a position to actually afford having their own data center or having a secondary data center. So in that case, having a cloud data center as the secondary is certainly better than not having anything um, or having something out to the cloud might be a better solution than keeping everything on just local disks on laptops. So there's always a point in which you interject. We as a company focus on more of the commercial into upper commercial enterprise. We work with federal customers, some larger sled customers. And in that case, we're finding that those are the companies that really can do so much better, not only in technology, but certainly cost uh, by staying on prem. And as you said, certainly SaaS and PaaS, there's a lot of different places where it makes a lot of sense. But we're finding that some of the smaller customers, cloud may be a viable solution. So I don't see it going away completely, but I don't see the development of infrastructure to continue at the breakneck speed that it did. 10 years back to about five years back. It was really all the rage. Everybody said cloud, nobody knew what it meant. And finally, when the CFO started getting to look at some of the bills, they wanted to know more for certain. Yeah, so that brings up an interesting point, a little bit off topic, or maybe on topic, but a customer came to me. We actually share our workload between two major public cloud vendors. And they have one dedicated team, which could be made up of a few individuals who basically has to go through on their monthly bill invoices to verify if it, because they have their different metering strategies and yeah. they have to go through each and every single invoice to make sure that they're getting what they need or, yes. or they're being charged appropriately. So if it takes two or three full-time bodies to do your invoicing and make sure that you're not getting overcharged and so on, that's a cost that was never factored in. For sure. Now you have accountants doing the job in IT department. It's really <laughs> something. And I'm, I'm sure you experienced this when you started the company was we used to sell and you would meet with IT directors and VPs of IT. Today, the conversation is so much more of a business conversation. We're frequently talking to chief financial officers, to CEOs, to business leaders in the organization. And it's really critical for them to understand what the cost is. And to me, I think the predictability of your billing is a very critical factor that they always have to take a look at. Yeah, I agree. The predictability factor is something that a lot of customers are struggling with right now. And that's why we always come back and we say, for me, in my opinion, keep your infrastructure, some of your infrastructure, some of your workloads local it still makes a lot of sense, especially when it comes to protecting your data. Again, I don't want to rehash this, but maybe in 45 seconds or a minute, yep. if you can tell us the elevator pitch of what Exagrid does for clients of all sizes, because I know sure. you guys have appliances that can fit smaller businesses to larger organizations. If you can give me the 60 second elevator sure. pitch, I think our audience would really benefit from it. Okay. I appreciate the opportunity to do that. So Exagrid is a tiered backup solution. The way we operate is we have an appliance that employs a two-tier system. That top tier is called our landing zone. That's where we ingest data and start to process that data and kick off a process called adaptive deduplication in which we start sending data to longer term storage, which we title our retention tier. And that retention tier is non-network facing, which means it guards against ransomware and allows for very easy recovery of ransomware. And we further protect data through two technologies, 
one calling delayed delete and the other call retention time lock, where you can actually lock down the system and be sure any attack or any type of deletion is stopped right on the dime. So no further damage can be done. And then we have a very simple recovery method. And all of this is supported by a world-class support organization to help our customers. Fantastic. And it's scalable. It's highly scalable. Thank you for that. That's a phenomenal <laughs> point. It really is. Mr. Andrews would not be happy that I missed scalable. <laughs> I but, watch all this stuff on ab- guys on point, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, scalability is incredibly important, not only for what we're doing, but for our partners where they get Exagrid going at a customer and being able to have that customer grow the solution as they need to and not having to overbuy or underbuy just to show a certain price point. Scalability and being a scale out solution is very critical. Those that we compete against, whether it's a straight disk is not scalable and very costly and traditional inline deduplication devices, again, do not scale very well and cause a lot of forklift upgrades. Got it. And you can sit behind any backup vendor? We can sit behind about 25 different backup vendors and it's pretty much all the major ones. And we can also take in some native workloads from SQL and Oracle and things of that nature. Awesome. Uh, Which is important, right? You need to be highly volatile, versatile, I think, when you're doing backup. You need to be able to fit with different vendors, right? So that's great. Christopher, look, man, you know what? I really had a good time talking to you today. Yeah, Luigi, uh, thank you. you. you It's a pleasure. You made me feel good about our commitment and partnership with ExtraGrid as well. The technology discussion was great. The industry conversation, I think, was even better. So if we just need to recap this, I think we both agree that hybrid models here to stay, we're, we're not going to probably see the exponential growth in cloud as we saw the, over the last decade. Agree. And, and cost is probably the most important factor here when it comes to cloud computing. I think customers want to rein in those expensive costs or unknown costs or un- unpredictable costs. Yes. Yeah. All great points. Fantastic. Anything uh, else l- you want to add? Lunch is on me the next time I'm in Montreal. Oh, man, Let me know if awesome. you're around. <laughs> I'll be around for sure. For Everything sure. that I'm heading up to Canada in mid-February, but it's my favorite time of the year there. This time of the year, man. I, I, I was built to withstand. I mean, for the Bruins game in February? No, they're playing in April. No, I'm just doing a tour of Eastern Canada and uh, we'll go see some of our friends in Toronto and Pat and Ottawa. Certainly make a stop in Montreal and we'd love to. We'll be waiting you. for you, man. Here All right, Christopher. cool. Appreciate it. All right, man. Have a good Thanks, day. Luigi. Have a good weekend. Have sure, a great man. weekend. Thank Take you very care. much. All right, bye Bye-bye. now. Thank you for listening to 10 Questions to Cyber Resilience, brought to you by Assurance IT. Assurance IT is in the cybersecurity space, specializing in data protection and compliance. Since 2011, they primarily help mid-sized enterprises in Canada. If you have questions about protecting your data, reach out to us directly at info at assuranceit.ca or visit assuranceit.ca.